Can you, Isabel, introduce us? Ich, I'm not Isabel. Can you introduce us, Isabel? Ah, okay. <laughs> I hope you die very soon. Die and then please go ahead. We have one big problem. If you're a sales guy in the world industry and you enter an account and you raise a question, you're a loser. You just lost, dude. You're a loser. You're not supposed to raise questions. You're supposed to know everything. And I think that is the really biggest... I have never heard about the five leg sheep. Is really? like the eierlegende Wollmichsau in German? The five leg sheep? Yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't exist. <laughs> but, but you're looking for something which doesn't exist, which is too perfect to exist. So basically, me and the boys... Walid Khoury, the sales training. Who? Walid. Who's that? Oh, come on. <laughs> sorry, Walid. <laughs> I'm not sorry. Christopher. Yeah, crystal ball. Okay. Crystal ball, but crystal ball with some hints towards, I mean, the beginning of a market fit. Oh, so yeah, there's still well, 20% left. Left. It's my bullshitometer which just detected that you were a bit too high. Is that legal? I think that's borderline. <laughs> God, we have a packed agenda for today. Hi, Björn. Hi, I was thinking I can't leave it as it is, <laughs> right? I mean, I do you a favor. I, I, I'm dressed like you today, just at least for the beginning. Not I have the so. feeling it will not last, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Antoine. Welcome to today's episode of The Water Show. I appreciate the gesture. So we are still in this KLM sucks. A period of times where I'm dressed like that, we have to work with not the right microphones, not the right equipment, but still the content of this water show is awesome. And it starts with your editorial burn, which is today we have to talk about you know sales training. Clearly, I mean the offense you know department of our industry, which is sales, marketing, and business development, they are not proper trained and sales. You can see it in each and every corner. Go to the next conference, talk to them. You will see and you will discover very soon. Wow. There's a lack of competency from my perspective. Technically, yes, everything fine. But sales, come on. I think he has a very good point and I'm really looking forward to that discussion. For my top three this month, I got inspired by Björn's editorial last month and I thought, what would be three membrane companies which have the potential to disrupt the game? And I came up with a list and we might be debating that list. That's and even big like, word, huh? disrupt yeah. the industry. I know, it's a buzzword, so we might have to define it. And our deep dive is about... Even if you are a membrane company, sometimes you are faced with the fact that you have to go to a tender. Or let's say that you have to offer to a tender or that you have to put your product technology into a tender to win a, to win a game. And sometimes the question is, are we cheating ourselves or who you know, who's influencing who that, you know, my technology is part of the tenor that I can win the project. Actually, when we were preparing for the show with Björn, we found out that we share some nasty stories of you learn the tenders the hard way. So we will share some. If you have more, I'm sure you have plenty. Come share it in the comments. I'd really be looking for, I mean, we can even create a no words, the worst tender story. That would be great. That's not it because we have one more element today. We have a pitch and you know that we love the pitch. And the pitch today is about? It's about online microbiological risk monitoring. And that is an interesting fact because, you know, this affects really our life. Can we be safe? with the water we drink all day long. So a packed agenda, a lot of stuff to accommodate within one hour. We really cannot waste one more minute. So let's jump to the show. So that's the moment which I always like with these water shoes because I don't know before, what he's going to be ranting about. And yet, I have the feeling it's most of the time interesting, most of the time, not always. <laughs> and I have a good feeling for that one. Björn, the scene is yours. The scene is mine. Thank you very much, Antoine, for today's, you know, nice transition somehow. Now, today, really, I want to talk is about why do we think that we don't have to train our offense department and sales. So what, I, what do I mean by that is the offense department for me is clearly is sales, business development and marketing. And most of the time, if we onboard new, new people and we talked about that last time, people, it is all about people in our industry. That is the most crucial thing we will miss over the next years. But if it comes to training, it always comes about the technical part. I can give you an example. I, I, I started you know, many years ago with Kim Byron. He can't do anything anymore, he's so old. Kim Byron, calm, activated calm. He's so old. Yeah, he's getting older. So the first thing I had to do is I had to 
go to Belgium, to nice Belgium, nice in brackets, I love, love Belgium, I have to go to Belgium for two months and I learned everything about activated carbon. Teach me your tricks. Really, from production, I went to the lab, I went to everything. The only thing I was never trained in, but I was responsible for, was sales. The same I have seen in so many other companies I, I have been to, or I talk to other people. And if you run over, you know, the next fair trade show, I mean, talk to the salespeople. I mean, then you will feel what the lack is. I have met so many cool people which are somehow in the sales department, which are great process engineers, but actually they are not sales. Active listening, you know, argumentation, things like that, the closing question, all these kind of sales techniques I had to learn from myself. But I ask myself, why do we do not train these people also on sales? I'm not saying that nobody is doing that, but let's say the majority of, of, of companies in our industry, they are just trained the people in a technical way. There's always some kind of technical training. And then we send the people out into the field and we are expecting, hey, the next technology, you have to sell to this industry, to this person. But the technique to sell, to really to sell something, we are not giving them. Why is that? I don't, I don't get that. And I bet what? I, I give you a bet. If a company today would invest into sales training, compare the numbers, the revenue numbers based on the sales before and after. And I'm 100% sure. I will bet my money on that, that the number would increase. So that, that's really my question. We, we, are, we know that. We are very technical orientated industry, right? So we have to talk about technology and that's what we do quite often here as, we, as well on the table. But why do we not invest into the sales? So I don't get it. What was your background when you got hired by Kim Bilan? Environmental engineering. I never had any training at all in sales. Never ever. Because that to me is part of the question of what you're explaining here, because I give you my personal example. Right now I'm, I'm hiring two people. I'm looking for business developer profiles. Mm -hmm. And so they could come from- So what is a business development profile for you? That's the, that's the point. It could come from two backgrounds. They could come with a technical background and then I would have to train them on sales, or they would have to come from a sales background and then I would have to, to train them on the technical side. And to me, both are okay. And I'm fine with the prospect that you can find the five-legged sheep, you know? Yeah, yeah. By the way, if you're the five-legged sheep, talk to me. I'm really happy to hire you. But my point is you have to train the people to their missing skill or to the one skill you want to develop. But it's not, that is not what we normally do. Look, I mean, we had, I think, a year ago, more or less, we had a show where we had the open positions. Do you remember? We, we checked a couple of, you know, uh, open positions. They all had one thing in common. The one thing you have to bring with was a kind of, you know, technical education, an engineering degree or something quite often. This is quite often re a requirement to come to the industry. It is never a requirement that you have to be trained in sales, you have to be trained in marketing or, or even the business development skills, which are somehow the same. It's a matter of company culture because I can give you know, my very personal example. I started in marketing I wasn't trained in marketing. So I really arrived as an engineer what engineer into marketing and I had no training aside from being trained on the job. So there I would be fully with you. But then when I transitioned to sales, actually it was even my CEO at the time who took me as his protege and said, you know, uh, I was down the same route 10 years ago. Here are the books I read. Here are the, 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 the trainings I followed. Maybe you could get inspired by getting it. And then the sales director was very kind with me and took me like the Jedi and the uh, Padawan. And it was the Padawan and was learning a bit from... From who? Fr from the was sales it, director. Yeah, but was it an official training? Or was no, it, it was Okay, here are the books. Come on, read these kind of books. Was it on your own? So I, I mean, we, I, I we say, expect yeah. that the people do this on their own. But we don't expect that they are trained in the technical side. But that was my, my De Grémont background. Mm -hmm. Now, if I recall, when I joined GF Piping Systems, on my second day, it was a pure coincidence, but still, on my second day, I had a value selling training. You enter a company which has okay. a real tradition of sales, and okay. then, then you get the sales training. But, but I get your point. I, I guess that's more the exception than the rule in exactly. the war industry. Exactly. Yeah. So, 
Shouldn't we change that? Yeah, and actually, the reason why we should... Why, why isn't that the case? I don't get it. I have one more point to, to, to your argument, which is at some point in my, my career, uh, I was really passionate about sales and I really wanted to get better about sales. I was reading a sales book every, every, every week. And to me, the, every week. Yeah. Oh. And to me the, the, the best way to, to make sure I digest everything I read is that I had a podcast in French, which still exists if you're listening to French stuff. It's no longer updated, but you can listen to it, which was called Ingevante, so basically sales engineer, if you had tried mm. to translate it. And um, when I had this podcast, so I read a lot of books, and I did maybe 50 episodes, so roughly 50 books, and, and all the time I was like sharing one of the things. And out of these 50 books which I reviewed and, and, and read, the one which was the most influential to me is one which is called The Challenger's Sale. Mm, I and love this. The challenge of sale at first is brilliant, so really pleasure to, to read, but their full methodology is to say they compared the, the best performers to try to see what's their profile. Everybody thinks that the, 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 the best sales is again do, doing the relationships, and that's not the case if you look at the numbers. And if they look at the numbers, the most efficient sales guy is the one which is able to enter a factory and say, what you're doing here technically is wrong, you can do better, I can help you with that. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is that when you look at the profile of the people we put in sales position in the water industry, they are engineers. So they would have very easily this knowledge and this know-how and this confidence to enter a waste of the treatment plant and say, what? You're using your aeration on turbo mode, but that can't be right. Very respectfully, I think you could be saving 30%. Shall we look into that? On one end, we have everything it takes to do that. On the other hand, we have one big problem. If you're a sales guy in the water industry and you enter an account and you raise a question, you're a loser. You just lost, dude. You're a loser. You're not supposed to raise questions. You're supposed to know everything. And I think that is the really biggest is impediment. Is that really the case? Oh, let me give Come you a, a last of, of my stories. When I started in sales, I had a German distributor. Oh, okay. Um, so for Germany, he was like my, my agent or whatever. And when I was going to a plant, he was coming with me. And the guy was 40 years experience in the industry. Like, like he knew everything. And I entered an account, which he knew I didn't know. And I was starting to raise questions. And oh, why do you do that? And oh, how do you do this? And what's the history of that? And, and he was kicking me under the table, like, like, shut up. We're supposed to know that. You're not supposed to raise questions. And I was like, no, I'm discovering. It's a discovery call. I'm here to discover what, but it was against his conception of sales. So really, when we came out of that call, he was my agent that was supposed to be like the guy in charge of the region. He was so vivid and, and negative on me. Like, like, it's the worst sales call ever and I never want to make business with you again. And we won that customer because that customer was happy that I tried to understand him. So not trying to make big generalities out of that. I think you're right, we should be trained but to the right methodology, the ones which fit to this industry. And maybe it's also like uh, personal development. You are allowed not to know. You are allowed to raise questions. You're not allowed to ask them what's their name because that's your duty. <laughs> you have to do your, your, your homework. Yeah. But assuming you've done your homework, you're not supposed to know every single project they've done over the past 20 years. And you are able to ask and to, as you said, active listening. That's maybe I mean, the most important that, skill. That, that's exactly. The challenge to say is really to challenge this person. He's not looking for, for the answers. Maybe you kind of bring the answers with but that's you know we are starting now going into the deep the, the dive deep into the sales process but in principle you know we should educate the people more our own people if we don't invest in them and investment doesn't mean that we say hey here's a book you should read that there's at least one and we should expect that this person is willing has the willingness to do so if you get a good recommendation if i get a recommendation from you well it's pretty solemn i have to say but sometimes I read them. <laughs> so, and, and yeah, but you know what I mean, but the, but the mindset really is, I mean, you should bring that with that you want to learn that, but on the other hand, you have to support. I mean, yes, we have, we, with one requirement is that you have a kind of technical understanding to understand the pro product and the process that you are able to talk to challenge this person you're going to. But on the other hand, if you have no idea how to close, how to close this deal, you will never be successful. And I'm pretty sure the companies would be more successful if they would train the techniques, closing things like this. I mean, the easiest thing. So most people are just leaving, okay, okay, yeah, I will write you an email or I will send you a brochure. Then the most stupid answer, get a commitment by this person and then it works better. Which brings me to my five-legged sheep because I'd like to have your advice on that. Because five, I have never heard about the five-legged sheep. 
Is it really? like the eierlegende Wollmichsau in German? The five leg cheese? Yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't exist, but, <laughs> but you're looking for something which doesn't exist, which is too perfect to exist. So like, basically, me and the boys. Germany, the eierlegende Wollmichsau, yeah. Here, my question is, if you have to hire someone for a sales position, would you take someone with a sales background that doesn't know the water industry, or would you take someone from the water industry which doesn't know the sales? What is the easiest to train? It is easier to train in sales, but do you have to bring the technology with? I mean, we studied, the UNI, we studied for years to get this knowledge, even if we have no clue what these guys are doing here around us. But it is easier to, to, get, to, get, to get the idea how to sell something as to have a guy who is perfect in sales and to train him how the technology works. Because if you are a bad sales guy, because you don't have the sales technologies, okay, it is on you. But if you go enter a room to a municipality and you want to start have to have wanted to start a technical discussion, in a minute you will lose. One of the first things I, I learned was if you go into a, a water treatment plant, you have seconds to understand how everything works. You have to understand this by your own. And then you can discuss with your operator. If he, if he recognizes that you have no clue what this pipe means, what this filter means, what this is, then he will not talk to you. And that is the first lesson I learned on a hard way, by the way, <laughs> many, years, many years ago. But this is more harder, more harder to train the people, especially if you don't have the background. That's why, clearly, I mean, it is not by coincidence that all the, you know, open jobs that they have one requirement is a kind of technical degree. And then you can train them, but you have to train them. Come on, don't forget that and don't take it for granted that, yeah, they, will, they are somehow good in community management because they have 500 followers on LinkedIn. That doesn't work. Okay, so I, I give you one expression, which is the five leg sheep. Let me bring you another one, which that one is a really French one, so I don't know how much it translates. A fish always rots, starting by the head. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, and so here, the reason why I'm bringing that up is that do we have a sales culture in the management of the water industry? Oh, great question. Can we have a full episode on that? <laughs> I think that would be interesting. The reason I'm bringing that up is that I was once visiting a customer with uh, my, my head of BU, so member of the uh, administration, council, I mean board, whatever you want to call it. After five minutes in the call, he asked for the order. To me, that was weird. I mean, I know that there's this other extreme of the sales guy who don't, doesn't want to close <laughs> by fear of, of rejection but you don't enter and after having spoken five minutes and not ask one single question, ask for the close. And to me, that was a clear sign that he was trying to have customer interaction. So kudos to him, but he had no clue what he was doing. Yeah. You can't expect from your people to have this sales culture if yourself, you don't know what it is. To answer the question, I mean, most of the, of the people we have in the management position are technical guys. I'm more coming from the operation perspective, uh, or at least have these kind of, you know, CEO. The CEO, I think, is this position which follows the CEO most, call it this way, right? So if you are CEO, your chances are pretty high that you will become the next CEO. If you are the uh, CMO, the chief marketing officers, your chances are pretty low, even if they should be much higher from my perspective, but, but that's a different if you If you're the CMO, you're the executive assistant of the CEO, right? <laughs> you're doing the PowerPoints. <laughs> no, joking, but... <laughs> Great, but, 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 but to answer the question, yes, I mean, pretty, pretty sure. Even, even the most CEOs, uh, they have a clear technical background and don't have the kind of sales background. Okay, so last question from, from my end would be, you advise them to take sales training, which yeah. sounds like a good advice. What would be your approach to that? Do they use an external uh, consultant which comes and does uh, a training? Do you follow um, one I of these established methodologies to recommend a book what's the what's the way I forward mean, to, to, to go to your sales team which i don't know if you have 10 15 sales people and say hey guys read the book and that is your sales training hey come on you have screwed up immediately you have to take someone from outside but i have the fear that we are not used to have external trainers to train us how often does this happen beside big companies, big corporates, which spend tons of money because otherwise it's lost next year? But let's say a medium-sized company, they don't spend so much on training for their people. And they should too, for, for each and every purpose. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a new CRM system or the sales technology or is, I don't know, some, something different for HR, how HR has to react. And, you know, nowadays on social media, for instance, something even that, that would be a perfect training. I'm really happy you took that topic because I mentioned it's a topic which to me is very interesting. 
I would suggest that in one of the next water shows, we maybe have a look at the existing methodologies and we try to see what would fit to the water industry. Because it's a discussion, for instance, I had with Walid Khoury, which uh, repeats quite often that he, he's got the Who? sales training. Who? Walid. Who is that? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Walid. I'm not sorry. He had this, uh, this sales training from Hack, which is one of the ones you, you, you see references to, to pretty often. And you have some, some schools like that, which are pretty known. Okay. You have also then all the trainings which are totally irrelevant to the water industry, but still you see a lot of water companies because it's a training which is very used by the ones selling copiers, so why not? But it's not the same skills than to sell a water treatment plant. Yeah. I think that would be an interesting deep dive. If I'm the only one thinking like that, well, tell me in the comments, but uh, I would be interested in discussing about that. If you're not interested, guys, no, no, not a problem. I create another show which I call the Sales is a Water Show and screw you all. And <laughs> but. I think that would be interesting. The Sales Water Show, that would be really interesting to yeah. see the next project. Let's do a spin-off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great, let's do it. Great. And then I propose you for now to switch to the top three. So my top three this month is very highly inspired by your editorial last month. You brought up these this companies and you discussed if they were disruptive or not. That got me thinking, what would be three disruptive membrane companies I would have on my radar, which would not be the three you mentioned. So that was a double exercise. Is there a membrane company which is disruptive? I think so, more than one. And which is not the three you mentioned. So last month you mentioned, if I remember right, LeakTech, Aquaporin, and Edix Filtration. Correct. Good. So these three are excluded. I'm not saying they're not disruptive. I'm saying that for the rules I said to myself, I couldn't take those ones. And, and, and you can just judge after very short period of time? Or are these existing company now which disrupted just disrupted the market? No, no. Or are they in the process I'm looking to... in the future. I'm ah, okay. taking three it, companies which okay. I would... Cr crystal ball. Yeah, crystal ball. Okay. Crystal ball. But mm -hmm. crystal ball with some hints towards, I mean, the beginning of a market fit. Actually, my number three is a company called Membrion. I got to speak with the it's founder from, of Membrion. From, from Switzerland, uh, right? No, Membrion is from uh, the US. Seattle. The founder is uh, Greg Newblum. They do an ion exchanging yeah, membrane. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mix it up. Yeah, so sorry, ceramic sorry. ion exchanging membrane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have a very interesting positioning in the market, which is to say they go to industrial players and they target the industrial players which would truck their water away. And they tell them, you know what? You don't need to truck it away because we have a technology which enables to recover water, recover elements within that water and recycle that water. But we don't go to a full zero liquid discharge or fully circular, meaning we very, very strongly reduce the number of trucks you need, but you, you will still need some trucks. And the reason why that's very interesting is that you're not aiming to disrupt a process. You are taking a cost, mm -hmm. which is having to truck your water mm -hmm. away, mm -hmm. and you're reducing and squeezing that cost. So you're offering an improvement in margin to the mm -hmm. operators, you're offering them water, to very good prices, you're offering them to have a very efficient technology. So a kind of 80% solution. And the beauty is that you're killing the risk. Mm. Because actually, in case Membrion was not to work, which is not the case, they are very successful. If the technology was to fail, the other solution is still available. Put more trucks and that's it. So the barrier to disruption and the barrier to entry is very low. What is your, what is your definition of disruption? I mean, you asked me the question two months ago or last month. What is your definition? Well, to me, disruption is really if you take something and you turn it on its head and you do the oh, same. Yeah, that, 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 okay, that, that was my explanation from last time. Okay, got it. But you gave me the ex explanation. Okay, even Netflix and even, even Apple and it's not really, was not really a disruptive no, technology. No, that was not my point. You want to, to, to do again the debate from oh, last month? No, no, no. I'm ju I just want to figure out, okay, what is the disruptive element if you have an 80% solution, which is just nothing against membrane? Don't get me wrong. But let's say you said disruptive technologies turn on his head. Here there's a solution and you, okay, you, you, you bring another solution which covers a little bit the cost by 80%. Uh, that is my solution. So how is that really disruptive? I, what you I always, said? when you explain what I'm saying, I'm like, wow, I had no clue that that was what I was saying because no, it's really you, not what I was saying. You, you said they truck everything away. And in this case, if you take this solution, you you still have to track something, but not 80%. Uh, yeah, there's still well, 20% left. 
it's my bullshitometer which just detected that you were a bit too high. No, what what I'm saying, you 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 clearly said, hey, there is a solution there. I can track it away. If membrane comes into play, there's just twenty percent or whatever the percentage is, which you have to track away. All the rest is taken on membrane. Okay. So it is not taking really the everything on yeah. his head, right? Yeah. In French, we call that you you cut the hairs in four. So that's what Bird is doing right now. He cuts the hair in four. What does that mean? <laughs> It's like if you say that Netflix isn't disrupting anything because yeah, you uh, said you're still even, watching... even last time you said they are not profitable, and I say clearly, hey, I didn't look at the number. <sighs> you're making so much off tracks and side yeah. tracks. I mean, my point is. What is your point? You said disruptive you said, technology. Yeah, Come on, you okay. said that, uh, and I ask you, what is the disruptive technology for you? So in our industry, and still explain it to us. Can you stop just going on, off? Uh, crazy tangent whenever I put Sorry, something. Sorry, you, you, you're, not, you're, not, you're not aware that, let's say, your top three is for discussion or was it just a monologue? No, but discussion is something, but you're, ah. you're, you're asking something which has nothing to do with what I was explaining. I ask what me, what does it mean? What is, what is the disruptive technology from your perspective in our industry? So you have, just explain you have wastewater, which you're tracking away. Instead of tracking it. it away, now you're treating it on site and you're reusing the water. If that's not disruptive, I don't know what is. Okay, but I can use each and every technology. Yeah, okay. So that means yeah. everything I, exists already. We shouldn't do any innovation. We shouldn't invest anything no, because that, the that, startups that, that, fail that's, always, that's, and they are that, that, burning that's money. That's not what I'm saying. That's I'm, really I'm what asking, you're saying. I'm just what is this that guy hates startups. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'm trying to defend Ooh. the startups, but Ooh. thin ice, <laughs> thin ice. No, it's not. It's not. I ask you what is disruptive. I'm totally with Membrion, but I'm. Asking this question, is that really disruptive? And I ask you, describe what does it mean for you? What is disruptive? You have something which is deemed to be impossible to treat, which is to start, they go to industries and they say, you have a, a, a stream which is impossible to treat, fine, give it to us, we treat it. Mm -hmm. And before you were tracking it away to get discharged somewhere or burned somewhere, instead of which we treat it on site okay. for a lower cost. You okay. can recover water, you can recover nutrients, you okay. can recover stuff. That, and that's... you're not fully getting rid of your trucks because that's your safety net. Mm -hmm. In case mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. happens because you might not trust us, we are a new company. So if you don't trust us, no problem, you can still return to your thing of trucking away. Okay. So there is no risk. So they are de-risking something. So it's very innovative on the business model. And they are, on the other hand, using a technology with these uh, ion exchanging ceramic membranes, which is very new to the water industry, which was even coming from outside. They were developing stuff for NASA. And when they were de 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 developing stuff for NASA, they encountered some people who said, you know what? Actually, it's the investor who told them that. They said, interesting technology. Why don't you look at the water industry? And those guys come from outside the water industry. They came in the water industry because they were told there was a market. And then they digged it up. And actually, they had this approach that not every startup is taking. So something we might have been discussing last month, which is they didn't come with an idea. They said, we don't even know what's the problem. We don't know those customers. Let's go to the customers and discuss with the customers. What's your problem? Oh, we have to track away all this wastewater. That's such a mm -hmm. hassle. Mm -hmm. Let's come with a solution. That is disruptive. It's disruptive in the approach to the market. It's disruptive in the business model. And it's pretty disruptive from the technology. Okay, that means each and every anaerobic digest, digestive company is also disruptive because instead of trucking the sludge away, I can use an anaerobic digester, put the sludge into because I can process on site. Unless an anaerobic digester exists for decades. So ah, hard damn. to say it's disruptive today. Okay, disruptive has also a, you know, a, a period of time. Okay, let's do it like that. Uh, I'll put right now a specific sequence, which is going to be the official Wikipedia definition of disrupting. In business theory, disruptive innovation is innovation that creates a new market and value network or enters at the bottom of an existing market and eventually displaces established market leading firms, products and alliances. Oh, and also on a separate note, at that exact moment, a camera died probably of cringe listening to Bjorn, or maybe just because it had no battery anymore. And then another camera died some minutes later, so that sequence might end with only one camera, but don't worry, by the deep dive, all the batteries were replaced, so we could return to the three camera setup. Sorry about that, and if you have to blame someone, blame KLM. And now we can agree, you and me, that disruption is, is a buzzword, that you can stuff a lot of stuff inside. Let's, let's call it this way. It's a cool company. They have a cool business model. Call it this one. I have to explain that to the marketing guy. It's the top three company which are cool and have a cool business model. And you tell me if that's a better title than 
those three management company might have something disruptive. Okay. Number two is going to surprise you. Now, I mean, okay. you, well, who's, who's number two? Let, let me say, maybe there's something disruptive in the number two. That, that, that was a, a plague and worse, just to tell you, I mean, it's about a title. I mean, disruptive, yeah, I put know. whatever you... If that's what's blocking you, let's call them cool company. Are you happy that call them cool companies? No, I think we should be very clear. I mean, I'm German, right? So okay. I have to and follow the Second the cool company, happy? I, I, always. Okay, second cool company, which is nice in the business world and uh, with the Teletubbies, these cool companies. <laughs> what do I have to do to please that guy? Let's be serious. Number two is Evolve. Okay. What they do is, at the bottom and the heart and the theory of it, it's graphene membrane. Mm -hmm. So they are in the process of developing a graphene membrane. And in the meantime, what they're doing is that they are doing graphene coated membrane. Mm -hmm. And actually, their starting point is to say, if you look at a traditional membrane, we say microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, reverse osmosis, which defines the pore size of the membrane. Mm -hmm. Their number is to say that roughly 17% of the pores are from the actual size said it is. Mm -hmm. So if you say sulfur filtration membranes, it means that 17% of the pores are of this UF pore size. And what they say is that if you're using a different material, in that case graphene, mm -hmm. it is, I guess, easier is not the right term. I don't find a better term, so let's use easier to, to, to do it simple for, for today. It's easier to give it a shape, and so you can 3D print the membrane so that it has a very regular series of shapes, which means that you have a much more specific surface because you have much better pores. Why is it disruptive? <laughs> It is at least innovative, very innovative. I, look, I, looked, I looked into the company, I looked into the company and it's at least very, very innovative. Disruptive, again, this is a question of definition. But innovative, yeah. Now, if you want to come to the question of definition, there is one definition which Evo itself hasn't defined yet, is are they really a membrane company? Because they are innovating on different levels. They are innovating with this graphene coating, they are innovating on the membrane structure, they're innovating on the shape of the membrane, they're innovating on the application because they're going into uh, lithium extraction, they're going into uh, hydrogen and, and, and difficult to treat waters. But today, my gut feeling is that their biggest differentiator is the 3D printer. I had an interesting uh, discussion with uh, Andrew Walker, the head of marketing, uh, who told me a story which I didn't know, so I, that's why I'm crediting him because uh, that's a cool story. Maybe you know it because you're a membrane guy. Why are the membranes the size they are, they are today? I didn't know, so I'm acting clever, but I didn't know. What, what do you mean in size? Why, why, do, why are the modules these nine inches? Ah, module? okay, okay. Um, I don't know. Apparently, it's because that was the, the size a human can carry. So we are still producing membranes of that size because at okay. the time it wasn't done by machines. Humans had to carry it. And it's like, like the, the railroads, which have a specific size because it's what humans can carry. Well, same thing for the membranes. And what they are saying is that maybe they are all the shapes and with their 3D printing technology, they can tap into these new areas and, and bring better form factors. They have an existing product line, which is ready to take to the market. And they are developing the next steps, which might be fully graphene, which might be a mix. They're even working on more stuff, which is in the R&D. So interesting company, which just um, raised quite a lot of money. So just just some months ago, right? Yep. Jump, jump back a little bit. I mean, the, 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 coating, the coating idea is not new, especially not for a show. If you remember one of our first show, we I think had, it was number two. I think it was number two. We had Alex Brown from, from Leipzig. Um, he was something. He was he was doing something. It was a spin-off from from Leipzig University, if I recall right. And they do something different, uh, uh, similar to his uh, with, uh, with coating of membranes. I like the idea with the coating of membranes. And after I had the, the chat last last year with with Andrew about about Evolve, um, I was I was looking into the market for for that. And especially I want to want to talk a little bit with experts on the coating of membranes. What all experts, membranes, I'm not an expert on membrane, right? I'm always, you know, maybe I have some, some knowledge about membranes. But to all experts, I, I was asking, they are judging that. And that was something which I was really interesting. They all said, well, it's pre pretty hard to implement. It is pretty hard to have it always on the same standard. They kind of came all with the same arguments, 
which I was thinking, that, that is interesting. I like the idea with the, with, the, with the coating. If that really works, if you can have a used membrane, especially uh, that was one of, the, one of the cases, you can, you can coat that new and then it is have, have better structure as, as before and things like that, would be very cool. But all experts I talked to, they judged that a little bit. And that's why I'm, you know, it's one of the companies which are, which are on my radar because I like, I, at least I like the idea. It is very, very innovative. Let's agree that they are at least disruptive. It is really something you don't see that often. And to me, they, they, they tick the box because, as you said, it's quite a difficult field. They might if, succeed, if, they might if, succeed. If I remember right, you said, if you are the only one in this market, you have to be very careful. But they're not I the see. only one. You mentioned uh, Alex, which we had on, on the show. I'm, I'm not sure what, that, this was, I, that this was graphene. I discussed was with, kind an, of coating. with an Australian company called Nematic which mm -hmm. is looking into graphene membranes. So there are more than one company which are looking into graphene right now. You see companies digging into that. The interesting point is that I had your feedback of uh, some experts said it's difficult yeah, to yeah. code. So I was pretty blunt when I discussed with Andrew Walker and when I discussed with Chris Wires, which by the way, cool interview, which you should listen to my podcast. So the CEO of, of Evolve. And I asked them very openly, say, I am told, I'm not the expert, that it is difficult to code. And I say, it's not easy, uh, yeah. <laughs> but we nail it. You, you could say I discussed with the head of marketing it would be surprising if he doesn't tell me he nails it but first he was very open with the fact it's not a silver bullet that it works for some stuff doesn't work for other stuff yeah. and I also got by a total coincidence to speak with one of their customers as I was there and was interested and I asked them what they think about it and if it's working as well as I was told it, it is and the customer which has no stakes into that game very openly confirmed that yes, it's working for that exact application of lithium extraction that is absolutely- Ah, lithium again, the, the, that, that the, was the angle. Evolve is the number one market is that. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the, the funds they raised, mm -hmm. they didn't raise money from water investors. They raised money from investors which are from the additive material side mm -hmm. of things mm -hmm. and from industrial players which would push them into lithium. So there is a high porosity between lithium and water, but if you go with pure water investors, maybe they don't let you play in the lithium. So mm -hmm. at, number at, two, Evolve. At, at least, as I said, clearly, clearly a company I follow and uh, interesting to see the developments they do. But, see, but, 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 but an interesting question, are they a membrane company or are they a 3D printing company? After 35 shows, I start to know him a little bit. I know that when I come with a topic on membrane, he's very interested in what I have to propose. So That's my nature. <laughs> let me go to number one. And number one is a company called Zvitaco. Oh, I was expecting this. Right. Everybody is, is, is saying Zvitaco, Zvitaco, Zvitaco is number one. Okay. Yeah. Actually, everybody, including us, because Zvitaco was our guest in the water show from May, which recorded at the Global Water Summit in Berlin. So if you want to understand why I put them number one in my top three, I would recommend you to go look at our interview of their CEO and CTO. And for now, as we have just one camera left, and I don't want to bore you out with a static shot, I propose to switch to the deep dive, and that's just after the word from our partner. Water is the basis of all life. Depending on the use, a certain water quality is required. That is why it is essential to measure it. There are three dimensions to water quality. A physical, a chemical, and a microbiological dimension. Currently, there are only sensors to measure the physical and the chemical dimension. Therefore, only these can be used for process control. But process control is crucial to ensure the quality, efficiency, and safety of any process. Because there are no sensors for microbiological quality, this quality is unknown, although it affects health within minutes. It is still tested using traditional methods that take days to deliver a result and are unsuitable for process control. Because of this, all water-related applications are carried out in 2D, as only physical and chemical dimensions of water quality are available for process control. In order to meet quality standards for the microbiological dimension, oversized processes and overdosing disinfectants are necessary. This affects all water treatment processes from drinking water to wastewater. If process feedback is missing, a process cannot be controlled and therefore is not efficient, not sustainable, and not safe. The shift from 2D to 3D process control requires fully automated rapid microbiological methods in order to provide the microbiological dimension of water quality for process feedback, process control, and early warning. Yeah. 
Our opening was about sales. Our second part was about disruptive stuff. Now let's go maybe on the other end of the industry, maybe the conservative end of the industry, because I think the main topic of our deep dive has to do with the traditional tender municipal sales. Do we agree on that? Tender, tender. What is a tender? I'm not asking because I don't know, because I'm asking. There are different types of tender, especially from municipality to industry. And we had the fact, I mean, we discussed it last time, that we have also kind of, you know, our, our job is also to educate the people a little bit into how the industry works. So what is a tender? How does it work? Let's discuss first the municipal tender. Good. So the municipal tender in most of the countries, if not all, is a legal obligation. You cannot just, as a municipality, say, I want to procure a new water treatment plant or a new wastewater treatment plant. You need to describe the performances and what your plant is supposed to do. And then people have to submit a bid according to those specs and then you take the best value. But let's agree it doesn't need to be a tr complete uh, wastewater or water treatment plant. It can also be a kind of product. Let's say activated carbon. Just a new filling of the activated carbon tank can be tendered. Everything can be tendered. Usually you have internal rules within a country, within a company as to from which threshold on you need to tender it, when do you need to take competitive bids. So most of the time it's the municipal word, but more and more the same applies to large-scale industrial plants which follow the same type of rules. But it's a little bit different, isn't it? It's of course different because you don't have the legal elements to it. Look at it like a, like a catalogue. I mean, you cannot say, let's take your favorite example, which is the car industry. You cannot write in a tender, I want a BMW 530i uh, from 1997 with uh, 186 horsepower. That would be too detailed. But you can write in a tender, I want uh, something which has four wheels, which has uh, a logo on it which resembles to uh, a propeller and uh, which has a power between 185 and 188 uh, horsepower. That would mean a sales guy has done his job to define that in a way that only BMW can win. And actually, that's our topic for today. How do you influence a tender? And from which point on is it too much? When are you almost cheating by influencing a tender? The, 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 I mean, the question is, is more, how does it, who does it help? How does it work? I mean, as you said, it described right. I mean, the big di the differentiator between a municipal and the industrial tender is an industrial tender can also be selective, very selective. That means you don't have to say it's an open tender and everybody, whoever wants, has to go to the tender. You can also say number A, B, C, leave three supplies. I'm just asking to give me uh, to fulfill the tender. While, you know, the municipality, which is more public, more or less everybody could go to the tender and could offer their service or the product, right? That, that's a different. The, the question is, I mean, how does it work? Let, let's describe, let's, let's go one step back. How does it happen? Let's, let's take the example from, from the municipality. Let's take the water. You know, we, the, the, two months ago, we have, to be, we have been to a water treatment plant and they had activated carbon. Let's take that as an, a perfect example. They have two columns with activated carbon with 10 tons each. So they have to replace one. So who is saying, who is really saying when and what? Who's filling the tender? How does it work from your perspective? I can tell you from my perspective because I, think I, you, was, I was in the activated curve. I think field. you're not picking the most interesting examples when you're taking like a sub-assembly. The, the most emblematic example is when you do a new build of a new plant or an extension of an existing plant. But it applies to the same rules. No, it's, the, the difference there is... Uh, I'll let you explain your example and then I'll tell you why, why I think there's another which is more interesting. No, 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 normally, let's say, a, a utility goes to an engineering office. The engineering office is preparing the tender and they write into the tender based on their neutral opinion, call it this way, what they think would fit best. So who is influencing the engineering offices, the consultants? I mean, the tech suppliers. Right? Or whoever wants to be influenced that, my, that this tender is specified that my product is more, let's say, outraged. Let's be even more specific and more transparent. They are not influenced by external 
suppliers, they are actively asking external suppliers to give them inputs because a consultant has to be an expert of everything. And that's not possible. You cannot be an expert of everything. So when the municipality comes and says, oh, can you do me the specs for the refilling of my activated carbon tank, which I stand my point is not the most interesting example, they will most of the time not really know. And they'll say, no, no problem, we can do that. And then they give a call to Kemvaron and they give a call to Norit and they say, what do you think? What do you think? And then they write a combination of the specs. That's what happens usually. Exactly. And that has a major caveat, which is most of the times, those standards are impossible to fulfill. True. Because Norit will know exactly what they can do, which Kemvaron cannot do. I mean, and yeah. Kemvaron will know exactly what they can do and which Norit cannot do. So what will they give as an advice to the consultant? Well, uh, Take this number, but the other cannot fulfill, exactly. but we can fulfill. So exactly. is that influencing, is that cheating, or is that just fair, legal? I mean, you can, you can find yeah. it everywhere, even, even for a completely water treatment plant or a wastewater treatment plant or even for the industrial applications. You will have always these kind of game. If you want to be part of this process, you have to go, you have to tell the people, this is exactly our benefit, only we have this benefit. That's why it must be implemented into the tender and then hey, we are done because only we can fulfill. The, the problem is a structural problem within the water industry. The consultants get paid to write a tender. They, they get money and a contract and an award from the customer to write a tender. And they don't have the capacity to do it. So what do they do? They reach out to people which have the capacity to help them with that. And those people, that? the suppliers, they are not paid to do that. They do it for free. They will never charge the consultants to help them write the specs. So their reward for that work is that they are allowed, everybody knowing it, to put some stuff inside the tender which, which helps them. So it's about fair to them. Mm. The question is, is it fair to the end user? Part of the question is, why in some cases do we need a consultant? But that's a different story. And I don't want to get too much enemies for today. But I can give you maybe three examples. The first example uh, was back in my, my, my Ozonia years. We had a plant uh, next to the Bodensee. They had been using all the evolutions of our ozone generators, mm -hmm. meaning they had the very, very, very first one and it was like a museum. They had every new model next one to another because every time they had to renew, they were adding a new one from the new generation. And they were very, very happy. They would have never considered switching. It was a customer which every three years was ordering a new ozone generator from Ozonia. But they had to go, to they had to go through a tender. But I was sitting with them and we were brainstorming what was legally possible to write in the tender so that they were sure to get us, on the other hand being fair that they still had a lever that we could not come with a stupid price. So we were like in a good relationship that open book, I was showing them my cost, telling them I need to earn some money. Is that legal? I think that's borderline. <laughs> I, I, I think that's borderline. So. I guess there's pre prescriptions that was years ago, but, but it's a good question. I'm not quite sure if it's legal because I'm discussing I with I can't the, believe that it's legal because the, re the reason why we have the tender principle is, is to avoid that, that. To avoid exactly yeah. that. Yeah. And, I mean, the, 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 other, the other thing, how you can, and then you can, and then you can follow with your three examples. I'm really looking for the other two. Um, the, the, the other thing is that you can, you know, you can structure this by ranking. So that means you're not saying, okay, uh, for, first of all, you have, to, you have to ensure that a couple of people can really offer and maybe you have one of, one of these items or specialties which are not so important and maybe you can overlook that you have at least a range. Take a flux range, take whatever technology, whatever the range is. And then you can rank that. You can rank that by OPEX, CAPEX, environmental, ESG, whatever you want. So that is your internal ranking. And even that, you can play a little bit hardball that the ranking is more in your favor than to the others. So even that is, well, borderlining, that's what you said. I believe that, that we had internal people which were tasked, I mean, I was part of those people when I started, which were tasked to review the specs of all the main competitors to see where was the difference. Yeah, exactly. Not even to say what's better, no, but no, what's no, no, different. No, no. What so that you can really specify. Ex everybody's doing that. Ozonia was having ceramic dielectrics and our biggest competitor was Xylem and they had glass dielectrics. So to this date, I still don't know what's the best, if it's glass dielectrics or if it's uh, ceramic dielectrics, but we were trying to specify all the time ceramic dielectrics and they were trying to specify all the time glass dielectrics because it's not saying a brand, but at the end of the day, only one can really fulfill. Exactly. And the same, we were always asking to have like, like a narrow space between the, the, the bottom and the ceiling because 
our generators were horizontal, so if you wanted to clean them, you had to have space in the width, but not in the height. So you were taking out the dielectric and you were cleaning. Whereas Xylem had a vertical design. So they didn't need any space on the side of the room, but they needed space between the bottom and the roof. So sometimes Xylem would specify the roof has to be three meters high, and we would specify it has to be five meters wide. And then the consultant was taking the, the worst of the two and was taking a room which was two meters high and two meters wide, and neither Xylem nor us could answer because nobody had the right design. My second story is it was a plant's micropollutant treatment. They had to, to, to put a new biology. I mean, after the biology, they had to extend a bit the, the thing to add some ozonation. And they had some hard rock, so they could not go very deep there's two ways to go, whether you would do a side stream injection or you would go with a very specific design inside the chamber, which is called a radial diffuser and Ozonia was doing the radial diffuser and Xylem was doing the side stream injection. So my full thing wasn't to convince them that the radial diffuser was better, but to tell them side stream is bad because of this, 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 this and this. And at the end of the day, that wasn't in the interest of the customer, that was in my interest. And Vedico was doing the same, which I knew because my former boss was on the other end, the side of Vedico. And so my point with that story is that I think on that specific project, both parties were giving wrong advice because we were not giving them arguments about the right solution. We were convincing them that the other solution was wrong. And at the end of the day, the customer was like, but if the two solutions are wrong, I'm only getting a, a, a wrong solution. So I'm really not liking that. What if, what if, let's say, if we have the customer, we have the consulting company who's running the customer. And what if we have, would have a third consulting customer who is judging whether this is right or wrong? Usually in the big tenders, that stage it exists. You have a, a first consulting engineer who is here to write the tender for the consulting engineers. And then the consulting engineers get attributed on behalf of the first one who is not authorized to apply to the second tender. So you have this kind of third part who knows a bit and who's a bit above, but that's very theoretical. But None of them has a sure, detailed sure. knowledge of the but, but processes. What, but what about the point that if we have inside the utilities a higher knowledge that they can say, hey, Guys, if, if I take that tender, then I mean, it's clearly Vitico. If I take that tender description, then it is clearly Ozonia. So guys, can we change that? How would you know everything? It's, it's not possible. I mean, if that's the case, then you have to structure the market fully differently and you have to or, forget the consultants. Or, or a third, third option. Third option, you go to a third, <coughs> third party like the Tate ZV or any, any, other, any other third party, which is, which is not uh, part of the industry and they write a kind of specification which have to adapt to the utilities to me that's not really the problem to me the dvgw yeah instance. but to, to me the problem is if you're an epc if you're an oem you are paying your sales guys for two three years to not bring the sales just to specify stuff and you don't get money on that road it's just about fair that you try to get the benefit from that if the consultants were transparent to the end user and were saying, we don't have all the knowledge, we will need to subcontract a part of the study to the OEMs and the process specialists, then you would be paid to give a report, then the report would be black and white, and then the end customer knows that you've recommended your products, and then he decides, but by knowing what you're saying. To me, it's, it's only fair, as long as you're not paid for three years, it's very long. No, absolutely. Really, taking your sales guys and you're saying you're investing in the future and you're tendering yeah, but, stuff. But, 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 isn't it, but on the contrary argument, wouldn't, isn't, isn't that exactly, I mean, we discussed that, I mean, training sales and things like that. The incentive for the sales is, you know, each and every year. So they have to reach that goal, this and then, but they cannot reach the goal if they follow all the tenders because this will have a payback in three or later years. This is where so. You will maybe not be surprised. I have a hard time with the concept of tenders. To me, something is wrong with the concept of tenders. I understand why they exist, but the way what, it's set up... Okay, what is your solution? Ask the ones who bid to take guarantees on the treatment's efficiency. Because why do we have tender in the first place? It's because we want to be sure that a plant which is removing suspended solids really removes suspended solids and that you get 24 7 water without suspended solids so but but then leave it as open box deliver an open yeah. box and promise and guarantee this and this result yeah i think that would be much more powerful and consultants will hate it because that means you reduce their power they have too much power i, I discussed i discussed two years ago with someone from Zeus, exactly from paris exactly the role of the engineers of the future 
I mean engineers, I don't mean the engineers in general, I mean the engineering office, which you could say it's a consultant. So it's the same, right, for us, I yep. think. I see we agree on that. What is the role, role in future for these kind of engineers? Especially if, if let's say, a tech supply, if I go out and say, hey, I'm Convarin or whoever, I guarantee you that and I deliver a product, you shouldn't care. I deliver you a black box. So isn't that, let's say, a kind of kind of industry inside our water industry which will distinguish over the next X years? It's just a return to what used to exist and which was, in my opinion, better. Why do we call EPCs EPCs? What is the E of EPCs? Uh, let me think about that. Oh, engineers. Yeah, great. <laughs> and we decided to go after the American model, which is to have the consultant, which is like God and knows everything and does the specs and the EPCs become PC because E not really anymore. And I think that's wrong because if they have ownership for their designs, then hold them liable for it. Who? The engineer offices? Or no, the, the, the EPC. EPCs? The, if the EPC takes the contract and says, I yeah, can but, treat but, water. But the EPC is already, already in charge. If the EPC delivers something, they're always in charge with the warranty. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Today, you come with a fully engineered design, which is not theirs. They Absolutely. are bidding on it, and it's the lowest bidder who wins always, despite the law which says the best value, blah, blah, blah. It's always the cheapest mm -hmm. that wins. And then once the cheapest wins, you on top ask him to take process quarantines on something which is maybe not his design, he's not familiar with, and he would have done differently. And then what you have in most of the time is that that's even now the dark side of the same story, because that is now legal, but not moral. You can have a tender mm -hmm. and You've been discussing with the end customer before the tender and you know that they are asking for something but it's not really what they want. Then you fulfill to what they want and you put a lower price because you already know that it's not exactly what they want. Then you get the contract and once you get the contract there is an additional round. I need. Some, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how you call it in English. In, in French it's mise au point de marché. Mise au point de marché, what it means is that you have the contract in hand and now you're deciding what will really be built. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, legally, you can change almost everything. Absolutely. So that's a major problem with the, this tender structure, which is to me, we have been diminishing far too much the, the freedom of the EPCs to come with Clever Solution. And let me give my third story, because my third story is actually the worst of that system, because it's a way to take advantage of the system. I've seen that from major EPCs, like large European EPCs. And I've seen that especially in Eastern Europe, where you have tenders which are very, very complex and very, very difficult to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And then these major EPCs, what they do is that they ensure that at every single line of the tender, they comply. They make 100%. And it sounds stupid, it sounds trivial, but it's difficult because those tenders are almost impossible. But they make sure that they comply everywhere. And then they put a price for that with a lot of margin inside. So they are always like the highest speeders. Then they lose. And then when they lose, they are authorized to ask for the offers of the others. They collect the offer from the winning company. And they, and they say, compliant. line 1, 17, 22, 35, they're not compliant. And then they go lost. to court. Court says, they're right. Bid, strike. Second bid, they ask for it. They and they review. And they do that until they reach the point that all others are out and the major APC, which is bidding at a good price, gets the market. Which means that it's the opposite of my first example, which was a win-win. The customer wants you, mm. you want to be there to continue the legacy, everybody's happy. Here's the opposite. The customer doesn't want you. You're the company that has been in court five times against him to break the other contract. You're the most expensive, which means there's no chance of that turning out right. But you follow the rule. On the other hand, meanwhile, there are so many companies who clearly say, I will never go for tenders, especially on municipality tenders, because we don't have the manpower, we don't have the time, we don't have the money to follow all the rules. And in the end, it is still the lowest bidder wins. And we don't want to follow these rules. And that's why we clearly said, okay, I'm out of, we're out of this game. Even if we would have the best solution for them, we are not willing to invest any money. And that is also very poor due to the fact that not the best solution wins. There are only companies who have the manpower and have the capabilities to offer something, I call it by purpose, something, which is maybe somehow in the right direction, but it's never the best because there are so many other solutions which would maybe be better. 
but the company said clearly, hey, we will not offer due to the fact that the effort we have to take is much too high and we don't have the capabilities. And that is more poor than all the other things. I think if we try to, to go to, to the helicopter view, the problem is that we have a misunderstanding of what a black box is. We see a black box with a negative eye thinking, if we haven't specified everything which is inside, they must be cheating us. Whereas if you take it on the other hand, a black box might be a way to have something which works and you don't need to look into it, it's just gonna work. And I think it's a different value proposition you're making. So yeah, uh, lots of sales story. But Perfect, but let's say, talking about sales stories, isn't there a sales pitch we have? Hey, that would be a good one. Yeah, let's, let's move to the last section for today's show, which is, honestly guys, we are standing in front of a series of machines here, and I have no literal clue how they work, what they're supposed to solve as a challenge. Maybe we had a hint two months ago, but in the details, I think we should invite Isabel to have- We should invite Isabel, and maybe she is giving us a perfect elevator pitch. Let's go to that last section. So we told you that we have one pitch to close this show and this pitch is given by Isabel. Can you introduce us, Isabel? That's your job usually. We have here Isabel Nidochal from uh, Coliminer, so VWMS, Vienna uh, Water Monitoring Solutions. And she's responsible for sales and marketing and we will listen now to her pitch. Thank you very much. I'm so pleased, Antoine et Björn, <laughs> to be here. And I'm delighted to have the chance to introduce to you our Coliminder, which is a system for fully automatic measurements of microbiological water quality. First of all, let me ask you a question. How can you obtain a real-time result of microbiological water quality? It's impossible, right? For the time being. This is actually the problem we are addressing. Microbiological quality is measured or estimated by a WHO standardized method, which is on and, and accepted since over 100 years um, and applied as well. It's a manual lab method. It's based on proliferation, cultivation of the respective bacteria of interest. It takes one up to five days to obtain a result. That means that you would close, for instance, a beach for swimming tomorrow because the contamination has been occurred yesterday. Imagine this is not really suitable in terms of digitalization, of real-time monitoring, of data control and so on. So this is how the Kohleminder comes into play. I'll just introduce quickly the key features because I'm more of the kind of, you know, showing to you examples of customers using the Kohleminder. Its key features are, it's, you know, the size of a desktop PC. It is fully automatic. So it can operate completely standalone without any manual interruption, up to 1000 measurements. Because it is an online device draining or drawing the sample in, fully automated, doing a cleaning of the entire system after each measurement, which is very important, it is recalibrating itself. It's built for the internet age, so everything is online, obtaining results remotely is possible as well as even controlling the device with your mobile device from every point in the world through VPN access. It only takes 15 minutes from sampling to result. Here is the key feature of what is the huge difference between the traditional culture-based lab method and our Coliminder. And thus it is a process monitoring device. It is used for process control in any type of water. It can be used in ultra pure water. It's sensitive enough to even measure the slightest deviation from a baseline contamination, but it can even measure highest contaminated wastewater with up to 80 million CFU per 100 ml equivalent. You can use it in any type of water. Our customers, over 100 customers already all around the globe, are using it mostly for process monitoring, process control, for early warning as well. Let me just give a first example of one of our customers, which is Eau de Paris, Paris, this, um, uh, the city of the Olympic Games 2024. And they actually intend to do the swimming competition in Seine River for at least the ones for the triathlon competition. And as they know that Seine River sometimes is facing E. coli contamination. La Seineoise a consommé avec beaucoup de modération. They have already started in 2019 to look for the most suitable technology to monitor the water, whether 
competition uh, uh, participants are going to swim. And they have actually validated the Kohleminder to use it as a final decision-making instrument, using the contamination levels as an indication whether they are going to allow swimming or not, because they simply cannot use the traditional test, which has been done 24 hours before. One of our um, other customers is a, a, one of Europe's biggest mineral water bottling company. They are called Rom Aqua. They are located in Romania, but one of the biggest by volume per year uh, they are bottling. And they are using the Kohleminder throughout the entire bottling process. One device has two sample intakes serially, so they have placed it at the intake of the natural mineral water coming in, monitoring both water intakes they have in alternating mode to see whether contamination levels are all right. They are taking grab samplings from all over the bottling process, including the bottle washing machine and including the final product and insert it into uh, the second sample intake to see whether also in the process there is no contamination building up. Latest pilots also have shown that the Kohleminder works very, very well even in ultra pure water for semiconductor production. It's even sensitive enough for water for injection in uh, pharmaceutical production. It's absolutely made to be deployed in a process to monitor process performance even before or after a filter, before or after a membrane. You can see whether the membrane is working properly. And customers all over the globe already appreciate that. We can see it by our customers using the Kohleminder. It is used to make processes more efficient, safer, and also more sustainable, and thus contributes its little, small, but impactful role to circular economy and water reuse. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, very insightful. I have a question. If I am the operator, for instance, uh, of a small water work very close, and I have a UV and disinfection, and as well, I do have, let's say, the regulation perspective that I just have to measure twice a year. That's all I have to do. Why should I have such a very cool and you know very innovative technology to measure the, the, the bacteria all the time? Number one, it doesn't have to be every 15 minutes. You can set the measurement frequency to whatever is your requirement. We recommend basically to any a new customer at the beginning to measure with a higher frequency and then sort of see where the dynamics of the system ends. And that is maybe the key word to answer your question. Every system even if it's a groundwater wall in a small waterworks just you know here in lower austria every system got its dynamics these are maybe higher in a you know produced water system or water treatment system and lower maybe when it comes to groundwater but the dy dynamics are there and you will never be able to catch a dynamics of a water body when measuring twice a year this is how the kohleminder comes into play you can see what's the dynamics of your system when it comes to microbiological load and it also enables quick reaction. You will never ever see a fireworks anymore crossing or running on the, on, on the street announcing a boil water order. But still you said clearly it is still not required by law, still the other method by you know having having the having the petri dish right is still you know the the most common way and uh, part of the water law call it this way and this would be addition to help the operator or i mean what is the benefit for the operator if he has not has not to do that number one i'd like to add a little information to you it is indeed in part of the directive kind of regulations because in who but also eu drinking water directive they invented the concept of operational monitoring, which is the opposite of adding the, the real-time parameter to the compliance testing. They are aware that compliance testing of, of E. coli bacteria or whatever kind of microbiological water quality takes time, and they are aware that new methods are there. So they introduced the concept of operational monitoring to add a real-time information to the compliance testing, which we don't seek to to replace at all. The benefit for the operator is that he sees exactly, he sort of opens up a window, he gets an insight, he gets the knowledge of an actual contamination, probable contamination of the sample, and thus can react quickly on any probable events and even optimize the disinfection process. I have a very concrete question. At the very beginning of your pitch, you explain how your system auto-calibrates. First, I'd be interested to understand how it does that. And more broadly speaking, 
what is the maintenance interval of your system? How often would you have to run a regular maintenance on it? How often does the operator have to touch it? So number one about the calibration, it, the, all devices are calibrated here before they are being shipped to the customer according to the scientific definition of the respective enzymatic activity it is monitoring. And the recalibration is a sensor calibration, a light sensor calibration. It uses uh, the rinsing water, which it needs for operation anyway, which is DI or uh, RO or any kind of uh, ionized water, as it, it, use, it is using that one as a blank test. The cooling minder is built to be robust. So we try to include a low maintenance level from the beginning of the development of a um, device onwards. It's got a reagent holding capa capacity of 1000 measurements. So you just insert the reagents inside of the device. They have to be cooled, but the cooling unit is there. You insert 1000 measurements. So there is no manual intervention then after 1000 measurements to refill consumables. That includes um, the reagents, but also rinsing water and washing agent. And the other maintenance we recommend is every other year, an exchange of the internal tubing. That takes five minutes for our technicians and maybe 30 to 40 minutes for a technician using the manual we have for that. Yet if I do the maths, if I take an interval of every 15 minutes, so that makes four times an hour, that makes 100 times a day, that makes 10 days of autonomy. So every 10 days, if I'm using the maximum level of measurement, every 10 days my operator has to refill. So I need to have access to the device at least every second week. I have to add an information which we didn't yet address. It takes 15 minutes from the sampling to the result, but every measurement cycle is followed by a cleaning cycle, which takes another 10 to 12 minutes. So I would say every 30 minutes you have a measurement in continuous mode that makes 48 measurements per day, so a double of uh, manual intervention or a double of autonomy time. Last question on my end, how do you do the digitization part of the story? Do you connect to a cloud? Do you connect to a data logger? What's, what's your approach to that? Well, every cooling minder has got a modem built in and you just insert a data SIM card and the cooling minder automatically connects to the internet and connects to a dedicated server where it is sending the measurement results um, to. Actually, every two seconds, it is sending some raw data to avoid falsification of results because one measurement is sort of validating the other. So you would not be able to falsificate any results. So our customers can either choose to get the uh, measurement results through the dedicated website where they have access to with their own account, or they can use a Modbus TCP for a local interface, data interface. We offer a standard API like from our kind of cloud solution to another cloud solution of a customer. It's made for the internet age and fully integrate, integratable into existing data systems. What's your business model? Are you selling the units? Are you doing data as a service? Are you crunching the data for your customer? What do you sell? We, we have a, a CapEx um, a business model. We sell the devices and then we add on top a, a, a printer toner business model because you need the reagents, I, I said before. So every device in the field measuring needs reagents. So we have like an ongoing recurring revenue model on that. We are still not prepared as often we've been asked already to provide measurement as a service, but that's something we're about to outsource to our distribution partners because we don't serve the entire world from here in lower Austria. We have distribution partners all over the globe um, in most of the main regions and they are starting to offer measurement as a service, but that's not our business model. They buy the device and the reagents from us. Thank you very much, Isabel. Mm -hmm. Good luck with the journey and hope to hear more about you and the Kohlmander very soon. I really agree with your editorial oh, and damn, yes, I won. it gave me ideas because I'm serious what I told you in the opening. I'm actively looking to hire two persons. Uh, so by the way, if you're in North America and you want to reach out, I'd be really happy to, to accommodate you on a call and to see how we could work together. But it got me thinking, what is the onboarding sequence? What do you have to, to train your new people? And clearly, sales training has to be on that path. Inspiring, thank you for that one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For, for me, really, I mean, to grab all the old stories from the tenders, 
that was really interesting for me. And even that I'm not was the only stupid guy who did all the mistakes. I mean, I was sure that he had some some similar experience. So thanks for sharing that. It was pretty pretty interesting for me. And yeah, hopefully you guys learned something from that and can take it with and can take it better. And if you have a better definition than us for the word disrupting, or if you want to see everybody stop using that shitty buzzword, tell it in the comments. And that being said, see you soon. See you very soon, hopefully with a better dress. Yeah, Thank you very much. Hope so. <laughs>